better plan. So coming up next, uh, Lydia Dobson and Matt Nelson of QB Local 4600 and uh, Rebuilding Jones and Faber. Pleasure to have uh, so some people. Anyway. Yeah, um, well, I wanted to begin just by giving a little bit of context to our title, fight, uh, Fighting to Win. Um, our union, QB4600, has its pulse on the, uh, its thumb on the pulse of hashtag Twitter activism. So our hashtag was FTW4600 Fight to Win, um, which in turn was borrowed from the whole cap. But anyway, um, so we kind of want to make the argument that it's not that alarming or not that new to a lot of people, but that basically such like various groups such as TAs and contractors uh, serve as canaries in the minds of economies that are increasingly structured around precarious employment. Uh, and in Ontario, public sector colleges and universities have experienced significant spending cuts. The recession is usually blamed, uh, even though taxes are cut to the wealthy and corporations and ideologically universities and conservatives are bemoaning the lack of uh, a return on investment for various uh, students and things like that, so the corporatization of the university. But in universities and corporations alike, the use of contingent workers is a cost-cutting strategy that allows employers to shed their legal obligations to employees, all in the name of vague notions of uh, flexibility. Um, this translates into greater job and security, of course, and more wages and benefits. And in this context, some commentators have proclaimed the rise of this like precariat. Right, it's like a cross between the proletariat, I guess, and uh, precarity. Um, it's a distinct class characterized by increased insecurity and atomization. So um, these commentators are sort of describing it as this new economic reality that's characterized by uh, precarious work. So this reality captures the notion of workers who are in unstable employment positions, limited control over the workplace, uh, and wages and sometimes a lack of clear protection, regulations, or even um, union protection, uh, even though in the university sector we're grateful to have a high level of density, but um, we're, we're talking about like part-time temporary employees. Um, there's a, a 2011 book by a British economist guy standing, uh, it's called The Precarious, The Precariat, The New Dangerous Class, and he argues that trade unions could be uh, it's not likely that trade unions could be reformed to represent precarious interests. So in this context, context, we wanted to ask, is it necessarily the case that precarious workers and their workplaces are impervious to traditional forms of labor organizing and mobilization? And Carleton University, where we're from, is no exception. It's deeply implicated in reproducing the, the growing ranks of low-wage precarious um, workers within the institutions that once anchored this so-called professional class. Um, so it invokes, the precariat invokes this image of the overworked CI that scurries between campuses. Um, we like to call them road scholars. <laughs> <laughs> they drive around a lot. Um, and, and so this indeed is the sort of the lament of the contingent academic workforce. Even in the ivory tower, work is often solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. So for our purposes, we wanted to concentrate on the recent round of bargaining we had with uh, the administration and QB4600. So QB4600 represents around 1,800 TAs and 600 contract inspectors, <coughs> unit one and unit two respectively. And uh, just like universities across the province, um, budgets have been called for increased enrollment, meaning workers are compensated less in terms of their actual take home pay. They're doing more work and this uh, fundamentally affects the quality of education. So this round of bargaining lasted from June to March of this year, <coughs> recently settled. Um, so, this case study can provide a context for exploring the structural and relational problems that activists face in the broader sector. Um, first, I want to discuss two contextual matters. Um, back in 08-09, TAs had, uh, didn't achieve a strong mandate. We only had 49% of the vote. Um, this was amidst an ongoing transit strike in Ottawa and the York University strike that was going on in Toronto. Um, we had a thing called fixed to end tuition indexation, where the tuition uh, rate was fixed to a certain year, either 2000 or 2005. So it was a, uh, it was a protection against tuition rate, tuition rising. Uh, we actually lost this because we lost the strike vote, and it ended up becoming what's called a rolling index, um, which stabilizes tuition rates for the year the student begins. So it's a two-tiered effect. Um, so you get 
So if a student who begins their studies in 2011-12 pays approximately six more tuition fees than those who began the year before. So another contextual matter was uh, campus safety officers. They were represented by Office 404. They had a strike deadline that was scheduled the day before our strike deadline. And they had demands that, and they later did go on strike, by the way, that they recently settled as well. They were concerned about adequate staffing levels that haven't increased since the 1980s and compensation in line with provincial uh, norms. The, they're paid thousands less than other universities, other campus work, uh, security workers. So working together, the aim was to unite around the defense of public education. And you know, working in solidarity, it was hoped that this could be a good strike aversion strategy. So QB4600 specifically framed the message in terms of reiterating that the working conditions of Carleton workers are the learning conditions of Carleton students, trying to like make that connection. Um, so defending our conditions is akin to defending public education. Um, and we want, it, we want a campus where education is prior, prioritized and um, workers aren't disrespected or treated in a casual or precarious manner because the way the administration <coughs> treats TAs who our students and uh, CIs is an indication of how well they're willing to treat students in general. So this corporatization, in a sense, is an attack on pursuing knowledge for its own sake. Um, just an example, CIs at Carleton teach nearly, I think the number we discussed was 30% earlier. So around 30%, uh, they, they just disproportionately have to uh, teach large 500 person classrooms in these stadium style classrooms with a small army of TAs and they don't get any paid, they don't get paid anymore for larger classes. They make about $6,500 a class. They don't have health and dental insurance. Um, Until September. What's that? Yeah, the, we negotiated uh, the possibility of it. I'll get to that in a bit. But, uh, you know, one, one of our members wrote an op-ed in the, in the school newspaper talking about how he has, he teaches at two different universities. He has in four different departments and he has five different offices. So it's a Rhodes Scholar. Um, so, so yeah, I'll basically just talk about what the bargaining proposals we asked for to uh, alleviate some of the negative effects of austerity, and then I'll turn it over to Lydia. So the TA's um, bargaining proposals included uh, inclusion of gender identity in the no discrimination clause, which was relatively easy to get. Payment for working training, workplace training mandated by the government, caps on class sizes, Preventing student evaluations that may lead to workplace discipline, improved sick leave and provisions around leaves of absence, a 5% pay increase to keep up with rising tuition fees, a standard reference fee, a uh, tuition fee, going back to that fixed indexation year, um, cost of living arrangements, and um, employee compensation for accounting errors, which is a frequent problem at all. <laughs> they like to mix up the pay. Um, so for, for contract instructors, salary was a big one. Carleton makes an average of 8% less than instructors at other universities. Benefits, like Joel was saying, uh, the employer had signed a memorandum of agreement in 2010 uh, to establish a health and dental plan by 2012, and it's 2014, and nothing has happened. Um, university governments is getting a seat on some of these committees to have a voice, leaves of absence, uh, a more fair and accurate way of uh, evaluating teaching and uh, a joint committee around examining how new educational technologies will affect uh, students and workers alike because our president uh, happens to be a big fan of these moves. So, so I'll turn it over to Lydia. Though. Awesome, thanks, Matt. Uh, so I'm just going to be talking uh, a little bit more about our actual experiences at 4600 in bargaining and how those relate to being curious workers in a union. So one of the largest challenges facing union labels such as QB4600 is the precarity of our workers. As a result of having such a transient workforce, we as board members are constantly struggling in our efforts to mobilize and engage with our rank and file members. TA contracts, uh, while often guaranteed for the duration of our studies, operate on four-month terms as do those contract instructors. These short, part-time and unstable working conditions impede organizing and mobilization efforts within the traditional union model in various ways. So we'll be talking about a few of these that we experienced at Carleton and suggesting some, uh, some different alternatives going forward. So one of the first of our large challenges is um, apathy and voting. Uh, precarious workers such as TAs primarily operate on their two to four year collective agreements and the majority of these TAs are uh, on two year contracts, which depend on the workers also being tuition paying students. 
So, as such, while many of Carlton's TAs will pursue a career in academia, it's rare that they'll actually see the benefits of the collective agreement that they're fighting for. Um, as Matt discussed earlier, many of Carlton's contract instructors are forced to work multiple jobs in and outside of academia, resulting in mem as a result, members are simply not on campus and connected to their workplaces. Um, rather than rushing, rather they are rushing to prepare multiple lectures, potentially in multiple cities, or working a nine-to-five job and then running to teach a six-to-nine class. <laughs> okay, so the next uh, topic is. Um, there's a, there's a disparity in strike pay and uh, in the actual working conditions for part-time workers. So as a part of QP, um, when we go on strike, our workers can pick it and receive pay for working 20 hours a week, which is comparable to what our payment would be for working as a TA or a contract instructor. Um, as TAs though, uh, are, we're also students, and as students, we're told that we're not supposed to work more than 10 hours a week. So this directly conflicts with what we're supposed to be doing in our jobs, and, and it completely conflicts with what we're doing with students. Um, so during the strike, we uh, we had a lot of people that we had to had to encounter that were dealing with these issues. Um, this is also a problem for contract instructors who are teaching only one course and potentially live in another city and travel to work, or are working a full-time job and just don't have the time to contribute to this. So the actual strike pay agreement that we have with QP uh, really conflicts with. Um, with precariously employed workers. Next is an issue that we had specifically at 4600 with precarity and solidarity. So we have two units, unit one con or two, <coughs> unit two is uh, contract instructors, and both of our units have separate collective agreements. And despite us bargaining together, many of our goals are separate. So in this year's round of bargaining, uh, the contract instructors received a lot of what they sought, and uh, that included a substantial health benefits package, which was the crux of their bargaining. At the same time, the TAs were told that fixed tuition indexation would never happen, no matter how long we went on strike. We even proposed a 0% wage increase for all three years of our collective agreement in order to achieve this, and that was turned down. Um, so while the contract instructors bargaining team was satisfied with um, their tentative collective agreement, there was a massive backlash from TAs, when we presented our tentative agreements. And we were actually worried at one point that it wouldn't be ratified. Eventually both were, but it really showed that um, it's difficult to achieve solidarity when you have people seeking different goals, right? Um, so I'm just gonna skip this section. Um, so looking at what we can do, um, having precarious working relations impacts not only the workers, but it also impacts the students, which we've heard from a lot of speakers today. So going forward, it's really essential that we establish solidarity on the campus with students and with everyone working, and that needs to be emphasized and fostered. <coughs> Secondly, QP National and the traditional union model are essential in providing structures for precarious workers. However, the broad policies of national are often in direct conflict with our actual working conditions and needs. We have to address this and create more flexibility in these policies. And finally, as was demonstrated at several points in our collective bargaining, through rallies, info pickets, and solidarity events, direct action is essential to building both solidarity and fighting against the 